Okay. Um, so to round out our lovely history day, uh, we have a panel on um, is achieving security a hopeless quest? Uh, that sounds a little discouraging, doesn't it? Um, so we have some fabulous panelists. Um, all the way to my right, Margot Selsler, the Herschel Smith Professor of Computer Science at Harvard. <laughs> Yay! Key work in file systems and database systems, scalable computing and provenance, author of widely used software packages such as 4.4 BSD LFS. Um, we have Mark Miller. <laughs> Does uh, electronic rights at Google, privacy issues in the internet context. He was also the chief architect of the Xanadu project, which was an early hypertext system. To my left, we have David Mazieres, who's a professor of CS at Stanford. <laughs> He leads the Secure Computer Systems group there, so he should really be able to tell us how we get ourselves out of this mess, right? He's also the chief scientist at Stellar Development Foundry and GetStar. And finally, all the way to the left, we have YY Zhou. Yay. She's the Qualcomm chair and professor at UC San Diego and uh, makes practical tools to catch software bugs. So the plan for this panel is everybody's gonna make about a five minute statement. Um, and then um, we're going to ask each other questions about our statements. I'm not going to make a statement. They are going to make statements. And we hope you guys will have lots of questions as well. Hope this will be interactive. Uh, Margo, would you like to kick us off? Are you willing to do not that? Not particularly, but I will. OK. <laughs> um, so when I was invited on this panel, I was told that the topic of the panel was, is the state of security in the world like a failure of this community? So I've prepared remarks on that topic. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm not a security researcher. I don't even pretend to play one on the net. Um, but I will answer the question. The answer is no. <laughs> okay, just changes to this panel. Just to back that up a little bit. So I like analogies, and the analogy I like to use for the computer industry is the automotive industry. So the automotive industry is about 100 years old, and we're celebrating the 50th anniversary. So you might say, how are we doing? Well, 50 years ago was when Rolf Nader published Unsafe at Any Speed. So, so how are we doing relative to like the automotive industry in terms of things like safety? So it turns out that we have about twice as many drivers today as we had 50 years ago. And we have about 25% more fatalities today than we did then. So that suggests to me that, that whatever we did in the 60s and 70s like actually improved the safety of driving, but that things weren't actually all that great in the 50s or in the 60s. And in fact, if we look today, the automotive industry is still a way bigger problem than security. So my point is really, let's just chill. Like we haven't, we might not have solved the security problem. That It doesn't mean that it's not an important problem to work on, but we're kind of actually doing pretty well. So what do I mean by pretty well? So automobiles are on target this year to kill about 38,000 people. I don't think we're gonna kill that many people, <laughs> okay? The, autom the, the automobile industry, between accidents and things like that, the estimated price tag this year is gonna be about $300 billion in this country. The estimated price tag for cyber crimes in this country is about $100 billion. Now, you might say, well, yes, but there are so many more drivers than computer scientists. But wait a minute. I would venture to bet, how many of you spend more time in front of a computer than a car? Okay, yeah, raise your hand, every single one of you. And we know that the population at large spends more time in front of a computer than driving a car because we know that they're texting while they're driving their cars <laughs> and that they're also texting when they're not driving their cars. So in an industry that is twice as old as we are, it is costing twice as much or three times as much as the problems in our industry. So we are a relatively young industry. We're not superstars yet in the whole security thing, but we're actually not doing so bad. So I think, yeah, security is an important problem, but I am not nearly as pessimistic and, and hopeless as to think that this is like either a failure of this community or an insolvable problem. We've got a lot of smart people working on it. We will continue to make things better. And that's good because that means we will all have jobs even if the robots take over. <laughs> uh, 
As we've heard, in the 70s, there were two main access control models. There was the identity-centric model of access control lists and the authorization-centric model of capabilities. For various reasons, the world went down the identity-centric path, resulting in the situation we're now in. On the identity-centric path, why is security likely a hopeless quest? When we build systems, we compose software written by different people. These composed components may cooperate as we intend, or they may destructively interfere. We have gotten very good at avoiding accidental interference by using abstraction mechanisms and designing good abstraction boundaries. By composition, we have delivered astonishing functionality to the world. Today, when we secure systems, we assign authority to identities. When I run a program, it runs as me. The square root function in my math library can delete my files. Although it does not abuse this excess authority, if it has a flaw enabling an attacker to subvert it, then anything it may do, the attacker can do. It is this excess authority that invites most of the attacks we see in the world today. By contrast, when we secure systems with capabilities, we work with the grain of how we organize software for functionality. At every level of composition, from programming language to operating system to distributed services, we design abstraction boundaries so that a component's interface only requires arguments that are somehow relevant to its task. If such argument passing were the only source of authority, we would have taken already a step, a huge step, towards least authority. If most programs only ran with the least authority they need to do their jobs, most abuses would be minor. I do not imagine a world with fewer exploitable bugs. I imagine a world in which much less is at risk to most bugs. So uh, possibly kind of to, to address Margot's uh, points, I think the, the reason that we're talking about this today is because uh, kind of looking down the line, five or 10 years from now, it's going to be impossible to buy, you know, a toaster or a washing machine or a car that doesn't have remote vulnerabilities. So I think the idea is that if we keep the level of security where it is, that the stakes are going to be much higher. Uh, and, you know, it'll cost more money, you know, there will be fatalities and, and, and so on. So, you know, so then we ask the question, is there hope? And what's interesting is, well, we actually have existence proofs that there's hope because, uh, you know, Margot likes the automotive uh, analogy. Well, I once bought a car that had zero remote exploits. Seriously, it was a 1986 Toyota Tercel. It did not have fuel injection, did not have airbags, anti-lock brakes, but, you know, it drove from uh, for where, where we needed to go. Uh, so, and we know how to do these things. The problem is, like, we don't want to solve those problems. We want to solve tomorrow's problems. We don't want to solve yesterday's problems. So nobody's going to go and, and build a new 1986 Toyota Tercel. Um, so why is this problem? Why is, like, software this, this problem that's infecting all of our systems? But part of it is just the, there's this kind of perceived notion that software is free, right? If you look at your laptop, you probably have, you know, eight or ten different implementations of SSL on there, right? Because, you know, all your browsers have at least one version, and there's a shared library for the system. A bunch of applications incorporate them. And, you know, by contrast, nobody's going to put eight wheels on a passenger car, right? Because there's, like, weight and there's costs and whatever associated with that. So, in general, you know, it's this notion of... Of, uh, of, of bloat that the software is just going to come and like fill, uh, fill, every, uh, uh, fill all your available space and people are just going to add more and more because they, they don't perceive it as having a cost. Um, and that's in, in strict 
contrast to any other kind of design where you're worried about things, you know, if you're designing an airplane, you have to worry about weight and balance, and a car, you have to worry about, you know, cost and, and so on. Um, so, you know, I, I can't predict the future, so what I thought I'd do is, is you know, lay out three possible outcomes, and you know, which one we have probably depends on, on some of the people in this room. So I think one possible outcome is what I, I think of as like the boil the frog outcome, if anyone's seen the, 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 that gore movie, right? Where what happens is the, the cost of security issues, it, it kind of rises, but it rises slowly uh, every year, and so it's kind of like, takes up a bigger and bigger share of the economy, and maybe eventually it kind of levels off, and there are probably fatalities too, but you know, to keep it in perspective, maybe fewer people end up dying of you know, software bugs and self-driving cars than die of, of, uh, of uh, you know, drunk driving or whatever it is today that the software would be replacing, um, or we just kind of become immune to it, you know, like, uh, like Jeb Bush saying, like, oh, you know, school shootings, like, stuff happens, right, you know, but, um, so, well, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's sort of funny, but it's not, not really funny. So the second thing that I think, this is probably the least uh, likely, but we could end up with, like, some big catastrophe. The big, the big issue with these, these remote vulnerabilities is that you can have massively correlated failure, right? So you could end up with, like, one day, like, some attacker, like, cause all the cars to malfunction at the same time, and you get thousands of fatalities you know, across highways in the, in the country. Uh, and then almost certainly there's gonna be some like, misguided response, right? Because like, people will wanna react to that immediately with legislation and whatever. So that would be, that would be bad. Uh, you know, maybe longer term people would take it more seriously but, and change how they, I, I actually doubt that, that that would actually change security in response to the catastrophe. Uh, certainly uh, a lot of the responses to like, the terrorist attacks that we've had, if not, it's more security theater than actually improving security. So the last thing where I think there's the most promise is if, if somehow we get, uh, we, can, we impose constraints, but it's not gonna happen for the sake of security. So I don't really have any like, scientific basis for, for this hypothesis, but I've, I've always thought that one of the best things that ha might have happened to operating systems was the 64K segment limit on the, on the PDP-11, right? Because the fact that even as your machine got beefier and beefier, you still only had eight code pages and eight data pages per process. So it kind of like forced the system designers, they could run more processes, but each process still had to be this kind of like digestible nugget. And so I don't know if, you know, I saw uh, Dave Patterson's talk as, as, as I came in, and if you, could there be something with like the memory hierarchies where it becomes fashionable to like fit your whole program on the CPU's cache or something instead of going to some other level? I don't know. If there's some kind of constraint that incentivizes people to make their, build their systems out of more manageable nuggets, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that might help. But uh, I don't know what that mechanism is gonna be. However, I do know that the, that the two things that seem to be able to change how people program are number one, programming languages, and number two, APIs, right? If you look at, you know, Apple comes out with some new gadget and an API, like tons of programmers will, are willing to learn that and conform to that. So as, as people designing operating systems and working on operating systems, you guys actually make the interfaces that, that influence how people program. So I guess you know, my message is think about uh, how that can affect security and how that can help make systems more manageable. So I don't work on security. Um, I'm, I basically try to provide some you know, perspective from uh, users. Um, I think actually this morning, like Butler's talk is really inspiring. Um, I think it, because as a user, I want a convenience. I want to store cookies, but this way I can have personalized search. I don't want to type in the password again and again. But then if I get attacked, I want a security. So this is really similar to in many ways, actually, you know, I guess women think alike. I always think actually insurance, auto insurance, right? And auto insurance comes into play when you get into accident. So I think maybe actually sometimes the ultimate solution is maybe Geico sell, you know, computer basically like a security attack and insurances, right? So if you're like 30 years or younger, you have to pay higher monthly premium because uh, you're more likely to access dangerous websites or download the risk apps. And also, of course, you use some more like security tools or methods, so like a published SOSP, you probably have a, we can lower your monthly premium. <laughs> so uh, I think it really as a user, many times we don't want, know what kind of security level um, we want. Um, so actually many times, I, uh, 
Actually, many times I really wonder, like, if they can tell you, if you, um, you set up this thing, there's, um, you, if you don't, you're going to basically have a 1% chance you're going to encounter the, may have this kind of security problem. Or maybe sometimes it's one out of 1,000. Because if one out of 1,000, I may think, hmm, I don't have too many enemies, I will take a chance. And uh, also many times, I, want, I wish actually this, all these things tell me what is I'm going to, if I set up this security policy, what is actually I'm, I need to lose, right? What are things I cannot do? What a cost I need to pay? And I think right now it's actually, um, besides of course making system more secure, I think another major problem is actually we, we don't uh, we don't know actually how, how what be good way to allow user to set up actually the kind of secure level based on the way they want because each person probably wants different things and wants different kinds of trade-offs. And I think there also maybe there need to be some kind of risk on a kind of analysis of research to really understand what is the risk there, what is the cost of the security, what's the consequence. And also actually something even more concrete. Um, I talked with actually um, uh, Professor Ada Fatton from Princeton who set up a it's, it's a school of a policy at the Princeton. They said it's actually many times you have a too many kind of security like knobs or policies. Actually, the biggest problem is not just okay, you know, software has bugs, exposed vulnerabilities, but many times it's actually pe uh, the people like an administrator or those um, those data center, you know, administrators, they forget to set up a certain security policies, uh, or they just make mistakes. And uh, as, as a result, actually, many times, for example, if you are supposed to give me permission, but uh, you, you don't give me, I will complain. So you'll be able to find out easily. But you're not supposed to give me permission, and you still give me, I'm not going to tell you, right? <laughs> so in this case, actually, there are many of this kind of actually things. This is like a, even you have a nice access to control, you have all this capability, all these things, but the problem is someone needs to set it up. And if you don't set up in the correct way, and that there are many security issues will be basically exposed. So I think besides I felt like, because I work on bug detection, I know there's tons of you know, method you can try and further improve, you know, make it, you know, software less vulnerable, but there's also a major issue is the human factors there. And uh, I think that's basically so I uh, basically want to share. Yeah, so I think I want to I want to second the point about uh, insurance because it's not not only a plausible source of, of constraints in terms of you know what what systems can do. It's an entirely untapped resource, so we don't actually know. Like it might you, there might actually it might be possible to get some success through the insurance industry. Although right now they're completely not set up to do that. Uh, you know, a few days ago I was actually talking to someone. Who's, who's telling me about how like the Stanford hospitals like they have to buy cyber insurance because you know what if like people's records get leaked and it's like they don't ask any questions it's oh oh you want this much insurance like this this is how many employees you have like this is how much it costs it's not like do your users have two-factor authentication it's like nothing right so uh, so like that's not saying that that would work but it's at least uh, it's it's a, it's an industry that a has a stake in the game because this cyber insurance is going to be a bigger deal b they could potentially exert influence and c it, maybe it's useful uh, we don't know. Yeah. What? What? Well, no, I, I think it's actually up. synergistic, right? Because the point is that, you know, we could like work, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on secure systems. It's very hard to get them adopted, right? So if, you know, I have a good idea and like that idea could, uh, could reduce someone's insurance premium, like that's more incentive for me to do the research, more incentive for people to adopt my research. And actually, I think, I actually think the insurance is, so it's actually one of the things I almost talked about and didn't. But um, it's not so much that it ab we abdicate responsibility, but the existence of insurance would suddenly start to change the economic equation. The economic equation today is such that there is no motivation for vendors to spend more on security than they really want to. And so insurance is one way that you can start to exert pressure for different people to play different roles in that. And so I think it really just changes the economic equation, can also change it for individuals, right? So, you know, maybe you don't need to download that newest app on your phone if it's going to raise your insurance premiums. Um, so I... I, I <laughs> so I, I think this would work better at the institutional level. Like when you talk to a hospital about what software they want to buy. 
<laughs> so I want, I want to make one further brief point about insurance, um, uh, which is um, uh, earthquake insurance is very, very expensive because it's a correlated risk. Uh, in computer security, uh, the fact that insuring against the correlated risks would be much more expensive if there's a thick insurance market is very good for providing feedback to computer security. It means, it means that efforts like the formal verification of your operating system kernel, like in SEL4, um, uh, play the small amount of code that, that, that actually must carry tremendous authority, flaws in that code can lead to highly correlated risks. Flaws in application code for which there's many, many diverse variants uh, might be still severe risks, but they're not severely correlated, so the insurance would be much lower. I'll re remind people that if you have questions, you can come up to this mic over here. You should, if you have questions, just come and line up here, and we'll, we'll work through the line near, near Dan. Yeah, I have several requests, so one of them is right here with Peter Neumann. <laughs> if possible, uh, when, you, when you speak, I know it's hard to move around in here, so I'll pass the mic back to you, but if you could at least glance back at the camera back there. We're trying to record everything for posterity, and so we'd rather have your face show up at least once <laughs> than the back of your head most of the time. Thank you, Peter. Uh, quick, quick comment for. <laughs> oh, okay. users never follow instructions. <laughs> okay, I am speaking directly to Margot and David. Uh, for for Margot, I wonder how you feel about uh, the automated highway with driverless cars that are seriously impeded by the fact that they don't understand distributed operating systems, distributed programming, and so on. For David, I think the cheapest thing here is, is the three-wheel car instead of the nine-wheel car or whatever. And you're ignoring totally liability. Uh, insurance is, is ridiculous if you don't have real liability. I mean, what is the li liability of BW for what they've just done, for example. And, and that's a question we'll probably find out. Good. Z zero, so, apparently. Because you know, in terms of self-driving cars, my understanding from people who study this, both from the technical and the legal perspective, is that um, the technical issues are way, way easier at the moment than the legal issues. And I'm serious in ascribing liability and all the other stuff. So um, I'm actually not terribly worried um, you know, so, so I've recently had the experience <clears throat> of being the parent of a new teenage driver. And let me just tell you that the thought of handing the keys to him, which I've now done, is way more terrifying than the thought of letting him get in a self-driving car. So um, I'm, I'm okay, actually, with the whole self-driving car thing, and, and I hope that we can address the legal and all the other implications so it happens. I mean, I'll say that, so liability is clearly one way to motivate people, but uh, in, insurance premiums can also. And one, one point that we haven't made yet is that, that right now, a lot of these incidents happen, and it's very hard to find information about it, right? And, you know, okay, you have some cyber incidents, so you collect your insurance payout. But certainly one could imagine moving to a world where, like, oh, you, you guys just, like, lost 100,000 uh, Social Security or medical records or whatever. Uh, well, we'll pay the insurance, but you have to tell us exactly what happened with the attack. And so if, again, the, the insurance companies are not set up to do this now, but they could gather a bunch of information, and they would know, hmm, it seems that, like, hospitals that run this software have this problem a lot more than hospitals that run that software. And so they could say, like, well, you know, uh, we're going to dif differentiate there. And that's even without suing the original, you know, software vendor would probably have some end user license agreement disclaiming all <laughs> liability. Yeah. So I'll face the camera and be nice. No offense to you guys. So it seems to me that we're in, oh, mine's, I'm Carl Hewitt, sorry. <laughs> um, we're in the midst of a huge crisis here. Uh, even DOD recognizes it. Cybersecurity is the number one security threat. Seventy years ago, the physicists were confronted with a major crisis, too, and the physics community got their act together and operated extremely effectively. 
Now, the effects were enormous, some of them good, some of them bad. The point is the community got it, act, its act together and was able to act in a coherent way. We have not. We show no signs of getting our act together to do anything coherent in the midst of this major crisis. What would it take for this community to get its act together? Uh, can, we, can we, yeah, so, so, uh, if, 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 so one, one possible answer to that question is to say that they're not, the two situations aren't necessarily analogous, right? Because the sources of vulnerabilities aren't necessarily coming from, from people in this room. And because we've built systems before that are not, that don't have these vulnerabilities because they don't have computers in them. So the, the problem is more a kind of a problem of you have like, you know, a bunch of drunk drivers and we don't know, and like nobody, maybe nobody in this room drives drunk and maybe we're the car designers, but there's still people out there who are gonna, you know, operate the vehicles badly. And so what you have to do is, make vehicles that can remain safe even when they're operated by, uh, you know, people who are, who are being reckless. Um, and, so, and that's a harder, it's, it's a harder problem than just, uh, you know, s solving some problem. And it's also because of this negative goal of the fact that, like, we're not trying to do something sexy that we've never done before. We're actually trying to do what we did 20 years ago uh, again. Um, it, it's like the, the incentives are different. So I, I, want, I want to pick up on uh, the theme, a theme in what David just said, uh, which is um, going back to the earlier history of cars, there was this um, uh, habit of the car companies of saying, well, you know, the car was safe, the driver just drove it wrong. And the, a lot of the improvement in safety is for the cars to be much more forgiving of bugs in the driver. Um, I think that um, one of the things I really liked in, what, what, in Butler's talk was this thing about the assumption of perfection that came from the NSA legacy. Uh, I think we need to approach security uh, starting from the premise that most software has bugs. And I think the Salter and Schroeder's um, uh, principle of least privilege uh, from 1975, I think of all their principles was by far the most important one because if we were following it, then our systems would be much more forgiving of the fact that most software has bugs. We are grossly not following it. Um, and I think that the, the, um, of all the ways in which we might feel guilt or feel like we're failing as a community, I would say that the main one we should be focusing on is how to really reduce the privilege of most programs towards the least that they need. So there's, there's kind of two levels on which you can do that, right? So one thing is you can say, like, well, let's build programs that don't need a lot of uh, privilege. And there are actually a lot of people in this room who actually know how to do that uh, reasonably well. Uh, and then there's the second thing, which is to say, like, okay, if we really want this to happen, it's like the median programmer needs to be doing that as well. So one of the things that like, we started doing in, in our research uh, a few years ago is hire a bunch of random people off the street, sight unseen for three months, and say, okay, you know, like build a website using our system, because our system supposedly promotes better security. Um, and this is kind of interesting, because then you learn a lot. You see, obviously, you're there to help them when they get stuck. But, uh, but this was like one of the most interesting experiments that we've done. It's something, you know, if you think you're working on secure systems, I highly in encourage you to do that. Um, especially if it's on the web, it's really easy. You tell people like, use, learn web development, you know, a summer job, no experience necessary, um, you know, using our experimental system. And you just don't interview anyone, hire everyone who shows up and see what happens. So, so I, I, I wanna really go back to the fact that, you know, the community doesn't have its act together, whatever, because there are people in this room, as David has said, who have worked on things and have demonstrated techniques that work to help systems be more secure. Now, if those systems haven't made it into practice, that is not a failure necessarily of the people in this room. There's a broader community. And so the question is, how do you incent, you know, the people out there building the products that the majority of the world uses to adopt these techniques or incorporate them? And that's a problem that's way bigger than this community. 
So if that's really the problem, you know, in some sense, yes, we should be part of the tech transfer problem, but we can't do it ourselves. But it also means that the solution isn't training, you know, our students to, you know, program extremely carefully because right. that's, that's not, not going to scale. It needs to be providing interfaces that are less error prone. Right. And well, but then getting those adopted is right. So we we can design them until the cows come home. Well, but but that's even an open problem right now. I mean, well, you know, right, obviously, I think I'm you know, like my students have made pro progress on this, but it's like fairly new. Absolutely. So I think there are lots of people in this room who can say, well, we've made progress on problem X, but there's this other step, which is, and how do you actually get that to affect practice, right? Because until it's shipping in every PC and every cell phone and every tablet and every other device out there, the existence of the techniques doesn't actually make the world any more secure. Okay, so I'll, I'll take exception with that. I think you can, it doesn't have to be shipping everywhere. You need to get critical mass, right? Because once, uh, once a system reaches critical mass, that there's like a community that people can get their questions answered on Stack Overflow and stuff, then you have a choice. You know, you can plausibly choose the better system or the other system. So yeah. yeah. We've got okay, sorry, we're talking too much. All right, well. all right. Let's go to the go to the next question. I I don't know whether I can actually frame this as a question, but it's something you could respond to, and it it sort of was a thought that trickled into my brain the very first sentence that Margot said. But then, when Carl said what he said, I I wanted to, you said no, and then you stopped, and I was waiting to see why you said no, and I think. Certainly, the networking community has somewhat come around to the realization that part of what we're dealing with here is that to achieve security, which is sort of a, uh, an emergent property of a whole bunch of components of the system, that we're dealing with a, a problem that is highly uh, fragmented and we don't actually have an architecture. We, didn't, we don't actually have a definition of what security is. I mean, we all love it, but we don't know what it is. And the reason that you might very well say no is that you, we haven't actually clarified what part of the problem belongs to the community that's in this room. And, and so to, to respond to what you said, to answer that question involves agreement. So when will we get our act together? When we are incentivized to agree. Now, I can't get a grant from NSF by saying he wrote great work. The only way I can get a grant from NSF is by picking holes in his work and finding a substitute. And I've looked at most of the mechanisms we have for security in the network, and I can find at least seven or eight papers, usually each of which is a, is a minor tweak on somebody else, which meant that they got to name something, and they got their little paper, and they got their little tenure. And the reason that the physicists got together is because somebody paid them and said, I want you to agree. I want you to do this thing. And that's how we built the internet. Vince Cerf put his arm around you and said, well, you know, if you'd like some funding, you've got to come to this meeting and you've got to cooperate. And if you want to go off on your own little doobie idea, then you can go find your doobie little money someplace else. <laughs> okay. And, pardon? There was some heckler back there. Before we do any more response or questions, as the moderator, I will just say that I, we're going to do this until about five till five, and then we're gonna leave five minutes for wrapping up, okay? So we, have, we all have to watch our watches a little bit. Okay, Dave. Yeah, I, uh, I gotta say as an outsider, I get, the thing I believe that I heard today was when Butler Labson said, the air gap works. I believe that. <laughs> Uh, it, this reminds me of the conversations you used to have with the database people when we were talking about cloud computing and MapReduce, right? They said, oh, that's not that big a deal. We know how to scale systems. We can build systems that big. They, they actually never had, but they believed they had the principles that they could if anybody wanted to. So I guess uh, well, when I've hanged around with security people, uh, they're kind of more critics, right? And, uh, but I think you need to move into synthesis. I, need, I think you need to build a system, put it out there, have uh, X prize for, you know, to build a system that nobody can attack and put it out there and let people attack it and see if it works. Because I, I think you're saying that you've got principles that should make things better, but 
Okay. And you are know, you offering the funding for the X Prize? I, I think it would be. I think it would be. Heck, yeah. I'll put up a thousand dollars if one of you can put a system up. <laughs> so, I will personally pay a thousand dollars if one of you guys put a system up that has some secret, and you put it up there for six months and see if it. And it, you can't use AirGap. It'll use your ideas. Okay. So yeah. um, I'd like to respond to that. Uh, at Google, uh, I um, adapted the ideas from my research language E, an object capability language. I adapted them to JavaScript. Uh, we built a system called Kaha, that ha whose JavaScript component, the object capability subset of JavaScript, is called SES. Uh, it's been deployed on the web, protecting properties at Google and other companies now for over six years. Uh, it, it's protecting Google Sites. Uh, Google Sites is the Google property at sites.google.com. Notice that that's one origin for all sites. So the, the browser's same origin policy is completely useless at separating sites from each other. Um, uh, we've been out there for six years. We've discovered some very bad vulnerabilities ourselves. Uh, we've got a list of security advisories on our site based on the vulnerabilities that we've discovered. But in six years of being out there protecting these properties, we know of no incident in which an attacker has successfully um, uh, exploited a vulnerability in SES. Does that mean no one's broken into any site? It means that nobody has, um, I don't know whether. Uh, so how about you just put money, just put money up. You, I have a system you guys can't break into and get the secret, like they did with the, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the encryption keys, right? You'll give out so much when somebody can break this one, right? So put that, yeah, I'd love okay. to see examples of that, because right now, if we got our act together, okay. I don't know that we have an answer. Well, I don't know. We, okay. I, th I, th I think you're, you're setting the bar too low. I mean, it, it, unless yeah. the system has to do something, right? The problem is, like, yeah. even if we do that, how does that help us? How does that help cars with, like, IP uh, no, so I addresses think, and I stuff? think the way it helps is if, is if, if there were a million-dollar prize, right? If you can break into my system and you get a million dollars by demonstrating you can break into it, and you can demonstrate a system that people can't break into with a prize like that, then I think you get people to pick up ideas. Only if the thing does something useful. No, no, no. No, 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 the million dollars. Right, and, and. That's good. For what it's worth, DARPA has been doing this for cars. They put $75 million into Hackums to do precisely this for hardening, for providing more secure uh, aviation and automotive software. Right, but no one has done that for, you know, enterprise software, for lack of a better term. So until, until there's that kind of incentive, I don't think we're going to see the community move. Google offers and has paid over and over again uh, prize money for the demonstration of bugs, for example, security mm -hmm. bugs in Chrome. Um, uh, uh, and those, the, the awarding of those prizes carries prestige as well as money. Hi, uh, Charles Gray. Um, expanding on that topic and kind of going one step beyond incentives, if, assuming we had all the incentives in the world, uh, like all the phones, all the planes, all the cars, all the hospitals, do we have the science done to secure them? Or does more work need to be done? Could you just tomorrow say, hey, we're going we're gonna to build this, we know what to do, get to work? Or does more th thought need to go into it? No, there are, there are absolutely uh, tons of open questions, right? I mean, the, and, and, the, and the biggest open question is, is, th is throwing, what happens when you throw other programmers at the thing? I mean, it's, you always, when, you know, like my PhD students are building their, their things, you know, like, yes, the, the, they, they, they're like particularly careful, right? But that's not necessarily scalable, right? And you can build an operating system, but then people are gonna write software on that. And what mistakes are people gonna make when they write the software? Um, also, I think another factor is that things constantly changing. I think we expect a software to, you know, have a release every two two months if if it's an app, and if it's a like an enterprise, probably a release every six to nine months. So if it is constantly moving because people want a functionality and more things, it's, it makes it even harder for, to you know for, to achieve, achieve security. What can people in this room do to make these not problems? <laughs> Right, 
employee lease privilege of fine granularity. <laughs> but it's got to be it's got to be in a way in which people can understand it. I mean, we understand it things in terms of lease privilege, maybe even mandatory access control, whatever. But like, these are not concepts that you're gonna you're not gonna explain them in those terms to the people who are writing the bulk of the code that's out there. If you watch Mark Stigler's Lazy Programmer's Guide to Secure Programming on, uh, on Google uh, Tech Talks, that'll give you an idea of how the average programmer. Okay, uh, that's that's worth uh, repeating uh, into the microphone. Uh, uh, Alan Karp uh, just said that if you watch Mark Stiegler's um, uh, uh, Tech Talk, Google Tech Talk, um, uh, security, for, um, the Lazy Programmer's Guide to Security. Uh, what was the rest of your sentence, Alan? I'm sorry. Uh, that just shows that it is possible to design systems that the average programmer can end up with a more secure application. Yes, uh, the, the, that it is possible to design systems such that the average programmer will end up with a more secure application. Uh, let me say that, that that also fits with my experience. Uh, the, my e-language started at a startup company called Electric Communities. Uh, we're building a distributed social virtual reality. Uh, uh, more than half the programmers didn't, had no security background, didn't really care about the security properties. We're just trying to build a graphical virtual rea reality system. Uh, but they were using the e-language and using the architecture that we had built around it. Uh, and the result was that they constructed very securable systems so that the people there who cared much more about the security properties were able to work with the grain of what they had created using that infrastructure. Hi. So time Mike check, Schroeder. we've got five minutes. Does that mean we're done and I, I cut off? No, no, no. five more no. minutes of this, then That's five more That's all right if you want to. No, no, um, we're not cut. So I resonate with what Margo had to say at the very beginning. If you confine your view to normal societal interactions and disasters of moderate net magnitude. <laughs> but the problem with this whole area is that there's the potential for disasters of immoderate magnitudes, like some enemy getting a hold of a nuclear rocket and setting it off over the internet. And I, I'm very surprised that this whole discussion was so focused on things that you and I might run into every day and not on the potential for true disasters. And uh, what do, do you, we do about those things? But do you really believe that the likelihood that somebody can launch a missile over the internet is greater than the likelihood that somebody can walk through LaGuardia with a, a suitcase nuke? About the same. I mean, the thing, I think the likelihood that one of us without a security clearance could actually speak credibly about what it would take to launch a rocket over the internet is, is probably zero. So we can at least, but if we, if we, if we were, yeah, you could shut down the power grid, that's right. But you said they could not have detonated. Right. So, I mean, I, I, so anyway, that's obviously like an important problem. I think that they're, they, they might be separate, but, the, but you know, if you, if you set off bombs, but also take down all the communication infrastructure and disable all the cars at the same time, you know, uh, it, it could, there's, there's this amplification thing. So, uh, so yeah, you have to think about both. The big problem is it's all the same security technology everywhere, right? The same stuff that they're depending on to stop that is what they're depending on to stop the bank from having the accounts wiped out. I I I'm not sure. I think that the the technology that you need to secure, you know, the country's, you know, nuclear missiles, is is different from the technology you need to secure, you know, the app store where you have millions of programmers <laughs> like uploading random crap. Yeah, it, there's definitely stuff that helps, but... Well, they both could run on SEL4, right? <laughs> right. I would hope. <laughs> no, that... But, uh, I, so, I think, you know, a number of things have, you know, important things have come up, you know, incentivizing security, you know, creating liability and stuff. Those are, you know, very important things that this community probably can't do 
you know, as much as, you know, that's something the lawyers might, and, you know, might be able to do. But uh, I want to bring attention back to kind of what this community can do. And uh, just from my own perspective, I got into the systems research world back in the days of microkernels when a lot of people cared about the principle of least privilege. And we were out to make, the, make everything 10 times slower, but that was OK. <laughs> because we were making it more secure. And those, you know, I'm, I'm already, you know, an old fart, I guess, because those were the good old days, you know, in, in some sense as I, as I see it. But then, you know, after that, there were, there were the distributed in, in a peer-to-peer -peer systems days where, you know, you know we, everybody, you know, wanted to create secure peer-to-peer -peer systems with no authority, you know. But then, you know, we tried to make secure DHTs and stuff, but then eventually, we kind of gave up. Uh, that was too hard. It was easier. And then, you know, cl the cloud came along. And it was a lot easier just to put it all in a data center, assume that, you know, whoever is in charge of that data center is honest and trustworthy and secure, make the security somebody else's uh, problem, and just focus on the performance and scalability and stuff. So I just want to call attention to the, and so, you know, ever since then, at least for the past 10 years, from my perspective, the regular, pro the yearly programs of SOSP and OSDI are usually dominated by papers that get in by making MapReduce faster. No, no offense to MapReduce, it's a great thing, but can we, you know, just in terms of, uh, you, know, pri uh, you know, priorities are, you know, should, uh, should the bulk of the papers be about making things faster or more uh, scalable? How many papers are actually about making things more secure, Dis but, uh, you know, discovering new principles? But, you know? but hold on. There are way, way, way more papers published at security conferences than at OSDI and SOSP, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so in some sense you're saying, you know, but most of those, yeah, yes, but, but they aren't the, doing the job that this community could do. They, most of them don't build systems, right? Many of them don't. They, they break things. They're really, really I mean, good at no, breaking no, no. things. Okay, They're so, so some on, of them hold build on, systems. Hold on, some, you know, okay. I, I, don't wanna, are, I know I'm a, a offending you know, half of the people here. I'm sorry. Well, like, but, you, you can't over. Uh, well, no, I mean, in, but, some sense, in some sense, I mean, there has been a fragmentation to a certain extent. We see this in a lot of, you know, the, you know, all topics fit into systems, and then very slowly, they migrate into their own field. So, right there are you know, we still have a couple storage papers at SOSP or OSDI, but there are entire conferences devoted to storage now, and there are like lots and lots of conferences devoted to security, and many of those do involve people who build real live systems. So, so, so let's be careful. Like this is not the only mm -hmm. community that builds systems and thinks about security. I think that that's a little um, myopic of us. <laughs> All right, Peter Denning tells me that we could take a little teeny bit more and ask one more question. Oh, and it goes to Eddie. Oh, no. Not Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to ask a hard question. All right. <laughs> um, no, I actually have a real question. Something that, I, uh, that I've noticed and dislike, and has happened a little bit here, is the assumption that security just has, security failures have infinite cost. Um, it's very natural and it's good for many people. So what I want to ask is, what is the ex like? What do you think an acceptable cost would be? It could be monetary. It could be in terms of what kinds of failures we allow. And I don't want fantasies about missiles exploding. Okay, so I actually collected data on this. <laughs> so so um, what I can tell you is that best estimates are that a large company pays half a million dollars, uh, yeah, half a million dollars a year. Um, on cyber break-in kinds of things, and a small to medium company, it's in the tens of thousands. And that is sort of the best estimate that people have come up with in our, this country today. So, so it's tiny. How is that $100 million? You said $100 million. Um, that number was fantasy. No, 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 that one, they, it, they came from different sources, so I have not been able to reconcile how they count, and I don't know how. I wish we were getting that. 
putting that on the mic. Any com uh, last comments? I mean, you, you know, yeah, it depends on the domain, right? I mean, if, if we could cut highway fatalities, like, yeah, what I, if we're killing 40,000 people a year on the highways and we can get that down to 10,000 when the 10,000 is because of software bugs instead of bad drivers, you know, that's an improvement, right? Yeah, and there and there and the, and there's a bomb. There's a bomb. There's a bomb right under the horn. Do not honk the horn if you get into a car accident. No joke, you'll lose your hand. Okay. All right. Can we uh, thank our panel? Okay. Um, to wrap up. Um, I found it very interesting that uh, Jack Dennis kicked off the day saying he put up a list of systems and said all of these systems were very, very different. We didn't even know the right word size. And uh, Dave Clark told us that it took decades to figure out the right thing to do, that we were off by 10x in our thoughts. And so I think it's really stunning to see how many things we have solidified and decided and figured out and are just not under contention anymore. Um, we clearly have lots of places to go. I wonder, though, how different the world might have been if a completely different set of people had encountered those problems. I always wonder that. You know, if you set down the road in a different way, could we have been someplace very different than we are right now? Um, but we're in a pretty good place, and I think it's been a wonderful day to celebrate that. I thank you all for being here. Um, I would like to thank Peter Denning. Um, so Peter, if you could come up here, please. So um, the first chair of SIGOPS uh, and uh, our host uh, with the Naval Postgraduate School just down the, the way here, none of this day would have been possible without his very hard work and setting the tone for all the speakers. Um, so one of these t-shirts, uh, lovingly signed by Operating System Principles, PALS, is for you, Peter. <laughs> and if anybody didn't have a chance to sign, if you can, uh, come take, uh, uh, grab the pen and still sign. Thank you, Peter. And with that, I'm happy to declare this SOSP history workshop closed. Thank you all. Before you run away, oh, sorry. before you run away, I want, I want to thank Gina for doing the job of the MC. It was really a privilege to be part of this. Very lovely. She had a tough job. You know, you know, you've come to a lot of these conferences before. You know how tough it is to keep speakers on schedule, right? <laughs> And I don't think we were more than about a minute or two off on any speaker, so that's pretty <laughs> fabulous. And that also goes to the speakers for taking the trouble to yes. practice their presentations before they mm -hmm. came to this room. Where is it? Can you announce it? So uh, don't forget we have an evening session tonight if you want to come. Uh, Peter Neumann is, is going to host that. And the purpose of that session is to give you all a chance to come to the mic and tell stories about operating systems past or tell concerns about operating system future. <laughs> 7 to 9 is the end of the morning. 7 to 9, the end of the Is that the beginning of the reception is 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock approximately. OK. Yeah, could you take the mic, Ethan? And is, is the history um, evening in the same place? Can you be just clear with everybody sure. where the, yeah, everything the, is? The history, the, his, the, the reception tonight will be immediately followed, actually kind of in the middle of, by the history, by the history thing. That's 7 to 9 p.m., 7 maybe, it might, might run a little bit long, in the De Anza Ballroom, which is down right off of where you got your registration badge. Okay, so history day, or history evening is in the same ballroom at 7, and then the reception will be 7 to 9. Right. I don't know when it'll start. Okay. Probably a little bit. Terrific. Okay. Thank you, everyone.